Aquinas College and the uh, Wege Foundation share a very deep commitment to sustainability, and I know you all know that. And we're grateful for all that Peter Wege and his family have done for us here at Aquinas with all the things that we do around sustainability. And we're pleased to have some of Peter's uh, children here in the audience today, and what a privilege. And I would like to introduce them right now, and if you would hold your applause until I am finished, uh, let's give them a warm welcome. I'd like to introduce his sons, Peter II, Jonathan, and his daughter, Mary, and her husband, Jim. Would the four of you please stand and be recognized by all of us, please? I have the privilege of uh, introducing our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Mari Lynn Miranda. She is a native of Detroit and currently serves as Dean of the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Michigan, as well as professor in the School of Natural Resources and Environment and in the Department of Pediatrics and Communicable Diseases at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital. Her presentation today will focus on the work she's done as founder of the Children's Environmental Health Initiative. This important program uses maps to help determine the link between environment and human health. Dr. Miranda has devoted much of her professional career to research directed at improving the health status of disadvantaged populations, particularly children. I know we're going to learn a lot from her today. So please help me welcome Dr. Mari Lynn Miranda to Aquinas College. So I'm delighted to be here. I, uh, a number, I spent uh, some time this afternoon over at City High School, and I really enjoyed the young people that I had an opportunity to interact with there. It's been an interesting afternoon because uh, several people have apologized to me about the rain. And, uh, you know, I really like the rain. Um, and one of the reasons I like the rain is that it reminds us that there are these larger systems and larger forces at work that uh, help us to remember to be humble. Um, the other reason I like the rain is it tends to make my hair really big so I look taller. <laughs> Plus, I have this total, like, rock star microphone thing going. I don't even know why I'm doing this. Uh, I, and so I kind of feel like I've got tall hair. I just need some really bright red lipstick along with my microphone, and I could be Madonna. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Pretty sure. So I'm just delighted to be here. The um, invitation from the Weggie Foundation to give this lecture was absolutely an honor and a privilege. Since I became dean in January of 2012, I spent a little bit of time trying to get to know the Grand Rapids area and real, always enjoy the time that I spend here. And I'm delighted to see all of you, and thank you for uh, your willingness to come out on this uh, rainy, stressful day to hear a little bit about children's environmental health. So I want to begin by talking a little bit about some of our evolving conceptions of environmental health, how we, how, we've, how we think about these things and how those things have changed over time. So originally, when we worried about the environment and human health, we were looking at a chemical and we were looking at individual chemicals one at a time and thinking about could that chemical cause cancer. So we had chemicals. Uh, exposing people and could that lead to cancer. So that was our original conception and we certainly found some compounds where exposure did, does lead to cancer. Um, but then as we learned more, we realized that it's not just cancer that we might need to worry about. We might need to worry about effects on the respiratory system. So does exposure to particular contaminants cause, um, uh, unless they, does it cause respiratory diseases of, a, of a, a variety of different respiratory diseases, asthma, COPD, those sorts of things, right? So there's, does it impact your thyroid and how it functions? Does it impact other, um, your reproductive success, those sorts of things? So we started thinking about chemical exposures and then both cancer and non-cancer effects. Uh, then the research progressed and our understanding of both the um, medical setting and the environmental setting uh, got deeper. 
and we began to understand that there were particular windows of vulnerability. So there are particular times in our lives where exposures to chemicals might be more important than others or might be more harmful to us than at other points in time. So an especially vulnerable time is during pregnancy. Very young children are quite vulnerable. Um, and then, you know, all the way, there's a, you know, there's a lot of... Um, uh, vulnerability all the way up through the early 20s. There's children, babies come into the world with immature reproductive systems, immature respiratory systems, immature central and peripheral nervous systems, um, immature uh, everything, <laughs> right? And so they're, they're, because of that, they have a particular vulnerability. And then as we get into sort of that middle stage of our lives from our sort of mid-20s to our up until around 50, we, we're, there's a lot more resiliency. And then as people get older and into 50s, 60s, 70s, et cetera, we become a little bit more vulnerable to environmental exposures. Now, if you're exposed to a lot in that middle age uh, category, you would still uh, have significant problems associated with it. But we know that there are these windows of vulnerability where we should be paying particular attention to what might be happening to people, and especially young people who are exposed. Then we began to understand it's not just these, these windows of vulnerability. There may be some people who are genetically vulnerable, that there are some, uh, some differences, small changes uh, that really required these new and advanced technologies to understand that make one more vulnerable. So the classic data point that you always offer on this is that 90% of people who get lung cancer are smokers but only 10% of smokers ever get lung cancer. So there's something about that 10% that have a particular vulnerability, and trying to understand what those vulnerabilities are is really important for us. And I will point out that there are, um, on smoking, there are any number of other respiratory and um, immune system effects that almost everybody is vulnerable to. So if you're caring about both the cancer and the non-cancer effects, um, even if you don't have the genetic vulnerability, smoking is still not a good idea. Uh, so then what we began to understand is it's not just um, chemicals and these windows of vulnerability and genetic vulnerabilities and cancer and non-cancer effects. It's actually the combination of your physical environment and your social environment. So if you have a young child who's exposed to air pollution, for example, and that young child in, it, in addition to being exposed to air pollution, otherwise has a pretty stable home, pretty stable social situation. Parents are there, parents have good jobs, there's food on the table, good nutrition, safe environment to go outside and play, all those sorts of things. What we're beginning to see more and more is the impact of the exposure from the air pollution doesn't, the, the, the child who has all that social support has more resilience to that environmental exposure. If on the other hand you have a child exposed to the same amount of air pollution and has a very stressful home environment, maybe they're moving around a lot, maybe it's unclear um, where they're going to be going after school, maybe their neighborhoods aren't that safe, those children tend to have more effects associated with that air pollution exposure. And we're beginning increasingly to believe that's because of some kind of priming of the neuroendocrine system that happens with that stress. So now we've got to worry about the physical environment, these chemical exposures. We've got to worry about the social environment. We've got to worry about windows of vulnerability. We've got to worry about genetic vulnerabilities. And we need to think about both cancer and non-cancer effects. So things have gotten a lot more complicated if you want to work in this area. But all that complication makes it really interesting to work on. It also means that we better have some new tools to be thinking about environmental health in this sort of comprehensive, integrated way across multiple chemicals, across multiple types of stressors and exposures, across the lifespan, across different types of um, people and what their genetic vulnerabilities might be, and looking at all kinds of different systems in the human body. So you need some new technologies, and I'm going to make an argument that there is one technology that we use a lot that can be really quite helpful as you're trying to to uh, disentangle these complicated uh, situations. So the, the technology that I'm a big fan of, and um, those of you who know me know when I say I'm a big fan, I'm like a really big fan, um, uh, is called spatial analysis. And by spatial analysis, I mean that for every 
single piece of information that I collect and that my team collects and my collaborators collect, we attach a spatial location to it. So every piece of information I might have about your health or the house that you live in or the quality of the house that you live in, et cetera, I attach a latitude and a longitude to it. Right? So I have a spatial location, and that spatial location allows me to link data that I might have about you to data that I might have about your neighborhood to data that I might have about health services that are available in your community, to data that I might have about community resources that are available in your community, et cetera. And this, um, <coughs> excuse me, this little video is meant to give you a little sense of how you might link all those data layers together. So the top layer here is environmental data. The two middle layers are social data um, that, have to, that come from the census. The bottom data is a street networks data. So I'm linking all of these things together and those purple spines that are running through all of this, those are actually the locations of individuals. So um, I know I saw Jonathan Giroux here from U of M Flint, so I hope you recognize that this, was, this is data from Flint. Uh, my research group, I was based in North Carolina for about 20 years, so most of the work that we've done to date has been based in North Carolina, and we're just beginning to build the data sets that we need and the data architectures that we need to be effective in doing this type of work in Michigan, and Flint is the, uh, one of the first places we want to work. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do you use this type of technology to um, better address children's environmental health? Before I can do that, I need to make this really important point. Anybody who ever talks about children's environmental health, if they don't spend a little bit of time telling you why children are not little adults and why we need to think about them differently, then they're not doing their job because this slide on how children are not little adults is, is uh, ubiquitous for all of us who work in this area. So the thing about children is that they're small, and they, uh, the really little ones, they crawl around a lot, right? So they're small. I always joke around that I like working with children because really small children because I'm taller than almost all of them, um, which doesn't happen for me too often. Um, I have three children. My third child that in the past two weeks has, is, uh, she's now taller than I am, so that's a big milestone in our family. She's really proud of herself. I keep telling her that's not a lot to be proud of. So behavior, they're really small, they're crawling around down on the ground, they're putting things into their mouth, you know, this looks like it could be something tasty, maybe I can learn something about the world. They learn a lot about the world by mouthing things, right? So it's not just teething behavior, especially prior to acquiring language. Children learn an enormous amount by, um, when, once they acquire language, um, but they're, they're learning all kinds of things. And if you think about it, where do you spray your pesticides? Where does dust settle? Where, do you, where, do, where is there a lot of cleaning product residue? It's right there, right down there on the floor, at the baseboards, all those sorts of things. You don't spray stuff up here in my breathing zone. You spray stuff down there at the, you know, in little children's breathing zone. So because of their behavior, they're exposed to more contaminants. Their metabolisms are really revved up too. So young children eat more food, drink more water, and breathe more air per unit of body volume than adults do. And because of that metabolism, they uptake more of what they're exposed to. A child in utero, resting heartbeat is 120 beats per minute. If your resting heart rate was 120 beats per minute, we'd be rushing you to the emergency department, right? That's, the, you know, we'd be worried about you being tachycardic, right? So they're just revved up, right? So they get exposed to stuff, and because their little systems are so revved up, they actually uptake more of what they're exposed to. And then there's their developmental status. They come into the world with immature, reproductive, immune, neurological, um, respiratory systems. And because those systems are still developing, they're more vulnerable to being exposed to, in, to environmental contaminants. So because of their behavior, they're exposed to more things. Because of their metabolism, once they're exposed, they uptake more things. And because of their developmental status, once you uptake more things, you're more likely to express a toxic effect. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about lead today. If I had an 18-month-old next to me and the two of us consumed a, a paint chip that had the exact same amount of lead, 
that child would uptake five times as much of that lead. Five times as much of that lead would get into their bloodstream, get into their neurological system and start affecting things. I'd be much more efficient, given my developmental status, I'd be much more efficient at excreting it and just getting it out of my system. So we really need to pay particular attention. To drive home the point about that hand-to-mouth behavior that children have, I love this photograph. It's my favorite photograph to share during any of my talks. It's not actually my child, but this is a little girl who really, really wanted a puppy. because she was needing a snack. <laughs> so they're not little adults. My guess is the last time you picked up a puppy, you did not do this. <laughs> so. so I'm going to talk to you about lead exposure. With lead exposure, we first understood the very significant neurotoxic effects of lead exposure all the way back in, the, uh, in 1898 when an Australian doctor published the first piece on lead encephalopathy. So we've known it's been toxic for a long time. We've really understood the symptomatic toxicology very well. And by symptomatic, I mean if you had been exposed to so much lead that you were symptomatic, I could look at you and I could tell that you were unwell. So you might have encephalopathy, you might have wrist drop paralysis. This was very common in industrial workers where with wrist drop paralysis, if you try to hold your hands out like this, you can't keep your hands extended. Your hands just keep falling, right? So if you saw that, you would say, something's the matter here. That's something that needs the attention of the doctor. You could have colic, which is this severe GI distress. You could have anemia, which I might not be able to perceive with my eyes, but from your behaviors and fatigue level, I might be able to uh, suspect anemia with my eyes. But all of these sorts of things, if you took a child to a doctor who had these kinds of symptoms, the doctor would say, this, well, first of all, the parent would know, I should take my child to a doctor, and a doctor would look at this child and say, that child is unwell. The vast majority of the lead exposure that occurs in the United States, however, is asymptomatic exposure. It's at much, much lower levels, and that when you're exposed to lead at these very low levels, you have these asymptomatic effects. It damages your central and peripheral nervous system. It changes your hearing capacity. It changes your attention span. Uh, it might induce some learning and behavioral disorders, and learning and behavioral disorders, of course, have a spectrum. They can be very, very uh, severe, or they can be much more attenuated, right? So, and you can change IQ. The thing about everything here that's in the blue box is that it's all, it all exists on, an, uh, on a continuum, right? So all of us in here have different hearing thresholds. So it would be very difficult if I, so it would be very difficult if I was all of your moms, I was about to say that, <laughs> caught myself. Uh, but if I, if I had all of you, it would be a little difficult for me to tell whether your hearing threshold over here was, a, was, was not very good because you got exposed to lead or it was not very good because you happened to come into the world that way, right? So all of these things are on a distribution. So a parent doesn't necessarily know that their child is unwell, that their child has had a toxic exposure. And because of that, it's, it's incumbent upon us as a public health system, as an environmental health system, as a society to say, what can we do to help parents? What can we do to help community groups? What can we do to help um, physicians and other healthcare providers identify the places that are likely to be risky for children and try to pre prevent these kinds of effects from happening? Because parents are not gonna be able to figure it out on their own. We, really, we just can't reasonably expect that. So, um, one example of this uh, effect on uh, these neurotoxic effects is looking at test scores. So if you remember that movie I showed you with all these data layers, well, we took several different data layers, one of which was all of the childhood blood lead screening data. Okay, so uh, children, there are, every state has what's called a lead surveillance program. So particularly children are, who are at high risk are supposed to be tested for lead. So we took all of that data and we connected it with end of grade testing data. So in Michigan, it's MAP data. In North Carolina, it's EOG data. In, um, in we've done this work in Connecticut. It has a, it's the MCT in uh, uh, Connecticut. So th there are different names, but the vast majority of states currently have end of grade testing because it's directly linked to the No Child Left Behind Act, right, and access to federal funds for school systems. 
So what we did is we created the, we took these two different um, data layers that have uh, test scores and early childhood blood lead screening, and we linked them together, right? We put those purple spines between those data. So we found children in the lead surveillance data who'd gotten a blood lead test when they were two, and then we reached forward and we found them in the end of grade testing data. So we connected one child, we connected another child, we connected a third child, right? So we built that, that movie that you saw, right? So one of the things that we know is we we know right now is that lead exposure causes neurotoxic effects. We don't and we don't know uh, there's it's not clear what the threshold is. So if we could say well as long as blood lead levels were below this level the child should be okay. But the more research we do, including research that my own group is doing, the more we come to understand that you know even little amounts of lead, very small amounts of lead, are really quite problematic for children. So for many years, um, so what we're trying to do is look at the relationship between, um, between higher blood lead levels and test scores, right? So I want to look at what's the decrease in test scores associated with higher blood lead levels. So for a very long time, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, had what was called a blood lead action level of 10 micrograms per deciliter. That was set in 1991. There have been people doing research on whether or not 10 micrograms per deciliter is safe for a very long time, including my group. The most of uh, all of us who are doing research on this did not believe that 10 micrograms per deciliter was a safe level. We've been pushing for a very long time for that level to get reduced. And even with an, ex an extensive scientific database, uh, a set of data on all and analysis on all of this, it didn't come down until very recently, about six months or so ago, the blood lead level got dropped. The um, blood lead act uh, reference level, as it's now called, has been reduced to five uh, micrograms per deciliter, right? So essentially, when it was at 10 micrograms per deciliter, the notion was that this decrement in test scores, kids were okay till you got to 10 micrograms per deciliter, but then once you got to 10 micrograms per deciliter, there's a decrease in test scores. If you get higher, it's a larger decrease in test scores. If you get even higher, it's an even larger decrease in test scores. So this is what you, know, what you should, if you have a standard at 10 micrograms per deciliter, you're kind of assuming that this is how things behave. And when we move the standard down to five micrograms per deciliter, you're sort of assuming that, well, that, that's, now, this is actually how things behave, that at five micrograms per deciliter, we get some decrement in test scores, or you could put on here IQ, you could put on here hearing threshold, you could put on here any number of things. But the idea is it's only above five micrograms per deciliter before you get effects, right? There has been a whole series of researchers, including my own group, who who uh, believe uh, that the data clearly shows us that this is what it looks like. That even at very, very low levels of lead, there, is, there are significant impacts on, and discernible impacts on cog cognitive development in children, and that these are showing up in school systems and are really problematic. So when I look at blood lead levels as low as two or three micrograms per deciliter, where we see significant effects on both math scores and reading scores, you're talking about 25% of the student population in the United States, right? It's not an inconsequential small number of children, and of course, I would argue that no number of children is an inconsequential number of children. So what do we do with these technologies? How do we address this? So here's, here's the way we approached it. We know that there's a set of variables that influence blood lead levels in children. We know that if you live in an old house, if the house isn't very well kept up, um, if there's a lot of poverty in the area, we know that there are risk factors for there being, um, for there being higher blood lead levels in children. The question is, how important is one relative to the other? Is it worse to live in a house that was built in 1940, but that's really well kept up? OK, that paint is likely to have much more lead in it, um, but it's really well kept up, so maybe there's not as much of the lead dust. Or is it worse to live in a house that was built in 1960? OK, the paint might be a little bit better, but it's a mess. It's you know falling apart and deteriorating. How do you weigh those things? 
So the purpose of this work here is to try to figure out what are the weights that should be assigned to each of the contributing variables. And if you knew what the weights were, could you use that to do preventive intervention? Because right now, if you wait till a child gets lead poisoned and then you go in and you clean up the house, you're essentially using our children as biosensors in the environment. They're the canaries in our coal mine is the other idiom that people used to use, like to use, but they're biosensors. You send all these children out there, they're living in houses, they get an elevated blood level and that signals you, oh, maybe we should do something about it. And I would argue that that's an inappropriate use of our children. Biosensors, just not a good idea. Uh, so let's talk about, um, let me give you a demonstration of GIS and this, these spatial models. So we do not have any of these models built for the state of Michigan at this point, unfortunately. We're working on, as you can imagine, having access to all of the data that you need involves developing uh, uh, a, a deep sense of trust between the agencies that are uh, responsible for managing those data. Uh, they need to believe that you have good systems in place and that you'll treat the data, data well, so there's a lot of relationship building. So we're in the middle of that process right now that seems to be going well. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a demo from um, North Carolina. This is Durham County, North Carolina. It's the home county from my previous university. Um, and to give you a sense of the, the kind of geographic scale that we like to work at, uh, this right here, these are the zip codes in Durham County. And a lot of public health work that's done on the environment tends to tell local health directors, well, here's the zip code that you need to worry about. And I, I've worked with a lot of local health directors, and I can tell you that it is not helpful at all to a local health director to be told, here's the zip code that you need to worry about. They already know what zip code they need to worry about. They need to know what house do I need to worry about? What block do I need to worry about? They need that level of detail because they live in a world of constrained resources, and they have to figure out how to deploy their resources effectively on a daily basis. So uh, there's a lot of work that's done at the census tract level. So these are all the census tracts in the county. Uh, so census tract, that's defined by the U.S. Census. Um, there are census tracts, block groups, blocks. So here are the block groups. Here are the blocks. Um, the, the layer, the resolution that we like to operate at is actually at the individual household level. I'm sorry. There you go. <clears throat> so I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see better what I'm talking about. So what we like to do is operate at the individual household level. So I'm really going to zoom in here. Right? So you can see the brown lines right there are the census blocks. Those little gray scra scraggly lines, those are actually individual tax parcels, by which I mean the house that you live in and the piece of property that it sits on. So what we want to try to do is tell local health departments, what are the specific tax parcels that you need to worry about the most? Right. So how do we make that happen? Well, I'm going to stay zoomed out a little bit like this, and I'm going to start putting on some of these data layers that we know are important. And I might do that. OK. And uh, so for example, we know that the year that a house is built tells you a little bit about how much lead is in the paint, so we should pay attention to that. So here's the, Here's the year built data. I'm going to take off some of these data layers just to make it uh, easier to see things. Okay. Okay. So here, uh, what's going on is that my computer is frozen. Uh, that I do not like. Let me turn these off. Okay, so what's trying really hard to draw here, this is uh, really interesting to me. This computer is literal. I mean, it's a rocket ship in terms of its power. I'm a little bit confused about why it might be frozen right now. But what it's trying to draw for you is the, um, the coloring in all the tax parcels 
uh, in the area. So red are houses that were built prior to 1940. Blue are houses that were built between 1941 and 1961. And that yellow buttercream color are houses that were built from 1961 forward. I'm going to try to see if we can get it to redraw here. There you go. All right. So you can see there's a concentration. This is actually central Durham. That kind of white, empty space in the middle, um, those are actually commercial properties. So what we're trying to do is figure out of the places where kids could be living, what's the lead risk associated with it. So you can see there's this sort of U-shaped band around the middle of central Durham of uh, houses that were built uh, very early and are likely to have a fair amount of lead in them. So if then if I put on here, well, what's the assessed tax value? Because we know that houses that are better taken care of tend to have higher assessed tax value. And, and houses that are better taken care of don't have as much peeling paint and uh, those sorts of things, right? So here, the darker the color, the higher the assessed tax value. I'm sorry, the lower the assessed tax value. So in all of these maps, the more vibrant the color, the riskier the housing is, right? So what you can see here, which is very interesting and characteristic of the US South, is this mosaic build-out pattern. So right here, this is a very low income, almost exclusively black and Hispanic neighborhood, small houses, small parcels of land that it sits on, immediately adjacent to a very wealthy neighborhood, much bigger houses, much bigger parcels, higher tax value. Um, if you had looked at the age of housing, they're all, they were all built around the same time. So these were actually houses, this over here, uh, this over here is Duke University, and this is part of Duke University also. So these houses were houses that were built with the intention that faculty and administrators at the university would be living there. And these houses were built for people who were working in service, um, in service positions at the university or in the mills that were right down here, right? So that's very characteristic of the South where you have this, and very different from where I grew up in Detroit, um, where you have these very low-income neighborhoods literally immediately adjacent to high-income neighborhoods. All you have to do here is cross one street and be in a different world. So you, so you could start to see the pattern of assessed tax value. We also know that people who own their own home tend to take better care of their homes, so tenure type. Here, the blue houses are one, the dark blue houses are ones that are renter occupied. The kind of pool colored aqua blue are houses that are owner occupied. I'll point out again, this is a great example. Here's a neighborhood that's almost all renter occupied. You cross Watt Street, and that is almost all um, owner occupied, right? So we, that's another risk factor because people won't be take, people just don't take as good care of their house if they're not living in the house that they own. Landlords don't pay the same type of attention. So then I also have some census data, right? I know that um, uh, uh, I know that uh, black children have higher bl uh, blood blood levels than other children, even controlling for age of housing and other sorts of things. So this is data from the census that's at those bigger chunks of, of uh, aerial scale. So here, the darker the color, the higher the percent of non-Hispanic blacks. That darkest purple color right in this uh, down here is actually anywhere from 64 to 100 percent African American. Um, if, you, if you wanted to look at the percent who are below the poverty level, the darker the color here, the higher the percent below the poverty level. Um, the darkest color in here is anywhere between 32 and 92 percent below the poverty level, depending upon which of those you look at. Um, we also know that things like uh, um, median household income have an effect. So here, the darker the color, the lower the median household income. Here, the darker the color, the higher the percent Hispanic. And this is taken from the 2010 census data. So we finally got good data on Hispanics in the 2010 census data. The data on Hispanics in North Carolina um, in uh, 2000 and 1990 was really quite bad. Um, so you think about it, these are all risk factors. I should be able to put all those different risk factors on here and uh, you know, look at all of these things together and get some sense of you know, where I should be focusing my efforts, right? So you see all those layers. It's like I'm playing a movie for you, except the movie's not very good. The movie's not very clear. It's not in focus. And it's really hard to tell what the plot is. So that's not a helpful map. 
And like I said, I, we're interested in being helpful to local health departments and community groups. How do you turn a map like this into a helpful map? Well, the way that you do it is you, so I'm going to turn off a bunch of these layers to clean things up. I don't like a messy map. Right? So what you do is you put into place, so I'm going to put the parcels back on, uh, you have, you get the blood lead screening data, okay? And I'm going to zoom in a little bit more here so you can see this better. So here what's happened is uh, these blood lead screening data are actually assigned to an individual tax parcel. So if I show this, if I go all the way in here, you'll be able to see it well. These, all these blood lead screening data sit on an individual tax parcel. So what that, in this graphic, the red asterisks represent um, children who had blood lead levels between 15 and 71. Right? So between three times the current uh, reference level and way too many times the current reference level. Uh, the mustard colored ones are between 10 and 14, so between two and three times the reference level. The green, the brighter green are between five and nine, and the lighter green are between zero and four. Um, so you, so, and I'll just, as an aside, just to reassure all of you who've ever had your children screened for lead and worry, you know, how can you be showing a map like this? Uh, these these uh, uh, blood lead screens, to, in order to protect the privacy of the children who are in this data, they've actually been jittered, and the actual location of the children has been masked. So when I'm displaying it for you, you're not, it, I'm not violating privacy. That would be a really unethical thing for me to do. Um, and this is a, a technique that's really important to employ when you're uh, doing uh, analysis like this, to think very hard about privacy issues. So now if you can imagine it, um, and here's where, you know, having the mic where I can really move around is great. So if you can imagine that there's a, a, a map of a particular area that's a horizontal plane like that, and drawn on that map are all these individual tax parcels, right? So what I have, every single place where there's a house where a child has been screened for lead, I have these stacks of data that are rising out of the base map, right? So from the childhood blood lead screening surveillance data, I know how old the child was when they were screened for lead, so I can control for how much hand to mouth behavior I might expect. I know what their actual blood lead level was. I know whether they were on WIC or Medicaid, which is a poverty indicator. Um, and I know what year they were screened, so I might, uh, I might know some things about particular programs going on in particular counties. I know all of that from the blood lead surveillance data. From the tax parcel data, I have another stack that's still sitting precisely on this, ta this tax parcel that's drawn on this base map. I know how old the house is. I know what its assessed tax value is. I know whether it's owner or renter occupied. And for our asthma project, for example, I also, in a lot of counties, know what the nature of the heating and cooling system is, which is really quite important. It's not the heating and cooling system isn't particularly important for lead. So I have the blood lead screening data, I have the tax parcel data, and then at a different geographic resolution, I have all that census data. So you can imagine it's like a stack with the fluted top, another stack with the fluted top, another stack with the fluted top, right? And the fluted tops are a little bit tricky to deal with, but you know, if you, uh, I can go into how you deal with them, but it's, it's basically with a lot of additional statistics uh, dealing with a problem that we call uh, spatial misalignment. Um, but you take these stacks of data, you bring them into your statistical analysis package, and then you use that, that database that you've built to figure out what the weights should be. And once on these different variables, to figure out what's worse, a house built in 1940 that's kept up really well or a house that's built in 1960 that isn't kept up well? How do those things compare to each other, right? So you use that to put the weights on the, the, to figure out what the weight should be on all those variables, and then you apply those weights to every single residential tax parcel. So then you end up with a map that looks like this. And I'm going to turn the parcel data off so you can see that better. Here, the dark blue represents the highest risk housing. The dark green represents the next level of housing in terms of risk. 
The lighter green represents the next level in terms of risk, and the um, buttercream, which you don't see very much of in this picture, represents the lowest level. So there's a little bit of buttercream down here. If you go to the southern part of the, part of the county, it's full of buttercream. Um, so, uh, uh, and you know, if you spend enough time do, making maps like this, you do find yourself saying silly things like the southern part of the county is full of buttercream. <laughs> Every now and then I hear myself and I think, oh my god. <laughs> um, so what you can see here is that there's this, this um, horseshoe that surrounds the central part of the city, and that's now referred to as the high-risk horseshoe in Durham. Uh, but even within these neighborhoods where there's a lot of blue, it's not all blue. So this map is called, is, is, we call it our 10, 10, 40, 40 map. It's called 10, 10, 40, 40 because the blue is the top 10% in terms of risk. The green is the next 10%, and then you have 40%, 40% after that, okay? Why is it a 10, 10, 40, 40 map? Because that's what the housing department said would be helpful to them, and that's what the health department said would be helpful to them. So the health department uses this to figure out where are their children who need to be screened for blood. So not only do I know where the high-risk housing is, I know where the children are. So I can look at every one of those high-risk houses and figure out whether there are children living there or not. Um, and not, so not only do I know that, but if you said to me, you know, I really only have enough money to rehabilitate 50 houses. What are the 50 riskiest houses? This model could tell you that. Um, it also can tell you where the places that have high-risk houses and a lot of kids, and where's there a daycare center or a church or a school where you could go do an in-neighborhood, a community-based clinic to screen kids, right? So there's a whole series of things you can bring together. In Durham County, when the health department switched to using this technology as the basis for their blood lead screening program, that with a... 0% increase in cost. They did not change anything about the amount of resources they were committing to this program. They had a 600% increase in their capture rate of children with elevated blood lead levels. So they had a 600% increase in the effectiveness of the deployment of their resources. And that's what local health departments need because they, are, they really need technologies that can help them get around their resource constraints. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation and um, sort of say, well, the problem, though, is that once you discover, so we, we definitely want to use this housing, uh, use this model to help direct housing rehabilitation, and we're doing that. But there are still children who have already been exposed to lead, and one doesn't want to give up hope on them. One doesn't want to say, well, too bad. And we, we used to you know, essentially think that the effects of lead, once you're exposed to lead, everything is irreversible. There's nothing we can do about it. There's this absolutely phenomenal body of research that's going on um, by a group of people, the best of which I believe is done by Tomas Guiarte, who used to be at Johns Hopkins and is now at Harvard, um, that's looking at can you do something to mitigate against the effects of lead. So what they do is they, usually when you house rodents in an animal study, you house them in a shoebox like this. And this is standard housing for them. So one of the questions is, if you took a, a mouse or a rat that was exposed to lead, who you were expecting some neurotoxic toxic effects, could you actually improve their outcomes if you gave them something like this to live in? So this is a, this is a critter trail, hamster heaven, blah, blah, blah thing. Um, I'm not a hamster person, so um, there, was, there is one that's called something like a super pet multi-store ferret home. Um, <laughs> some combination of those words strung together. Uh, so if you, if you put le mice or rats that had been exposed to lead, could you actually get better outcomes for them if they got this much more stimulating environment? And the way that you test it is with a water, one way to test it is with a water maze test, which is a spatial learning task. And of course, I'm always excited when we're checking on spatial learning tasks. Um, so what you see here is there's the rat swimming around in the water. That water, that pool is about this deep, so the, the rat's feet can't touch the ground. He has to swim. Um, you put a little bit of latex paint in there, so it doesn't really hurt the rat's eyes, but the, the water becomes opaque. And there's a platform. So the rat has to swim around and swim around and swim around until it finds the platform, and then, you know, then it can get out of the Then it can sit on the platform to get out of the water. It can stop swimming. So 
one of the things that you want to say is, well, if you, you're exposed to lead, how does this affect your swim pattern? How quickly can you get to that platform? Well, what, we did, what um, Tomas did in his work is he exposed some mice to lead, and uh, they were rats, excuse me. Uh, if you talk to rodent scientists and you call their rats mice or their mice rats, they get really upset. That's like a super big mistake. Um, so we took some rats and we put them in that shoe box, but we didn't expose them to lead. We took some other rats, we put them in that shoe box, and we did expose them to lead. We took another set of rats, we put them in hamster heaven, we didn't expose them to lead, and we took a, th a fourth set, we put them in hamster heaven, and we did expose them to lead. So what you can see here in this first thing for the, the rats that were um, in the shoe box but didn't have any lead exposure, it's a little bit hard to see even if you read the original article, but what they did is they just swam around the edges, they swam around the edges, they swam around the edges for a really long time. Eventually they got a little bit adventurous, got out there, and, and eventually, after quite a long period of time, found that platform. Here, these are the, the rats that were exposed to lead and put in that shoe box. And you can see they circle and they circle and they circle and they circle and they, they never find their way out. They never find the platform. They never venture out into the world. They don't come up with a new strategy for solving their problem. And it, actually, you have to pluck these rats out of the water so they don't drown. Um, we used to... Um, we used to have a pet snake for a really long time which, for which you get rodents and feed it. My youngest daughter, she was always so funny. After the first time she heard me talking about this and I explained it to her, she, before she dropped the, um, the mice in to feed our snake, she'd say, I don't know what's worse for you, getting fed to the snake or going to mom's lab. <laughs> so she's a funny kid. <laughs> she's just so great. So then if I take kids, I take kids, I take rats, who, <laughs> kids, rats. So uh, if I take uh, rats and I put them in that hamster heaven and I don't expose them to lead, look at their search pattern. It's fantastic, right? They're, and they're adventuring out in the world. They're searching. They're coming up with new ideas. And the amount of time it takes them to get to the platform is, uh, is uh, quite a bit quicker. What's really amazing and so gives you so much hope as someone who does work like I do is this picture right here where you expose the rats to lead and you put them in an enriched environment and you can see that you can do something about that lead exposure, that these rats can actually, uh, if you give them that stimulating environment, their neural connection, something is going on that's different and they have a much richer search pattern. This is encouraging news. Uh, so for myself, we were spending a lot of time uh, we were spending a lot of time in neighborhoods, in houses, and we noticed that there were all these children who didn't have anything to read in their houses. And at the same time, I was reading a literature that indicated even small amounts of age-appropriate um, print materials in the home make a huge difference in terms of kindergarten preparedness, uh, IQ, love of reading, love of school, all those sorts of things. Now, I was pretty sure that we couldn't solve the problem of poverty, but I was also pretty sure that we could solve the problem of children not having books. And this, this idea that children didn't have books in their homes drove me crazy because my kids probably have, each of them, have 300 books in each, you know, in their rooms, right? So what we did is we started this program called Bringing Books to Children, where we targeted children who were most at risk for lead exposure. We set up a partnership with the Head Start program, and every child enrolled in Head Start in the three counties that we, we started with one county, we went to three eventually, um, that we were working with, they get a backpack that's full of really good books, beautiful books, books that you would be so proud to be the owner of. Um, and books that are, so this is Jerry Pinckney's book. Jerry Pinckney is this African-American children's author, and we intentionally put, picked this book because of we wanted to point out in all kinds of different ways to these children what their possibilities were, that someone who looked like them was on the book flap and had made this beautiful, beautiful book. If you're looking for a gift for a young child, this book, The Lion and the Mouse, is just fantastic. So each backpack is filled with really good books, an application for a library card, a growth chart that gives you some tips about environmental risks around the home that parents should be paying attention to, and a sheet that talks about that provides reading tips to parents about how you can engage kids with reading. So 
we, that's our idea, how do we make it happen? Well, the first thing that you do is that you get people who you think can be influential um, to engage. So this is David Ferriero. He is the archivist of the United States. Um, he is a Otis. Uh, he's become a good friend, so when I email him, I say, hey, Otis, um, instead of a Otis. That's in, in the South, you always say hey instead of hi, so it's really, it's actually really funny. <laughs> so I wrote to David Ferriero and said, hey, we have this great idea, and you used to live in North Carolina, and I think you want to be part of it, and not only did he contribute to it, but he came to our backpack packing party, um, and uh, he gave the opening remarks to all of our volunteers who were there to pack the um, backpacks. So you engage people like that. You get corporate partners. So these are people from Cisco and a local foundation um, who helped, uh, who contributed money. And in addition, Cisco uh, employees started a reading program with the Head Start program where employees of Cisco went and read on a regular basis in the Head Start, pro uh, in the Head Start classrooms, which was a huge help to the program. You go out and you meet the children and you hang out with them, which is the very, very, very best part of my job. Um, and you explain to them what's in the backpack. So this little girl is helping my research director get her backpack on appropriately. You do a little bit of singing. You do a little bit of reading. You hand out the backpacks. Um, I love the fact that, I don't know if you noticed this in the poster behind, it says, ways to calm down. So you hand out the backpacks. Let me tell you, that's not a way to calm down. And then that's what you get. Look at that. That is, these kids are so awesome to be around. And it's just a, it's a really inspiring thing. So that's how we make the full circle of, well, we're doing this stuff that's preventive intervention. And for the kids who've already been exposed, we use that research that tells us that there are some very concrete things that we can be doing to help out the children who've already been exposed. So... I work for a mission-driven research group, CHI, the Children's Environmental Health Initiative, has a mission of deploying research education and outreach efforts to foster environments where all people can prosper. And I have the great good fortune of working at the School of Natural Resources and Environment. Being the dean there is, it is just a privilege on a daily basis to work there. Our mission at SNRE is, con is to contribute to the protection of the Earth's resources and the achievement of a sustainable society. So in many ways, you look at these two mission statements and you realize that what CHI is trying to do is just a piece of this larger effort that SNRE is trying to do. And this is one story I've told you about the work that we do at SNRE, but there are uh, a hundred, a thousand other stories that could be told about the good work that's being done there, our amazing students. It's, it's just a really wonderful place, and I hope you'll have more of an opportunity to get to know it. And we have the good fortune of being embedded within the University of Michigan, uh, which is an extraordinary institution. So with that, I just offer some acknowledgments. I'm grateful to the Weggie Foundation for inviting me here. It's important for me always to acknowledge my, uh, the funding agencies who supported my work. I also always like to acknowledge the families and children who participated in our work to help us figure things out. And I end all of my talks acknowledging my family because I believe that my family helps me to become a better scientist on a daily basis. That's my son, who's a freshman in college playing baseball down in Florida. I do not know where he gets that intensity from. <laughs> uh, those are my two daughters, and that's my husband. Uh, in order, my youngest daughter tells me that it's important for us to include all the members of our family. So this is our English setter puppy, and this is our pet lizard. <laughs> so with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have two microphones, one there and one here, if you'd like to come down to the microphones if you're able. If not, I have this mic that I can pass around and we'll take, take a few questions now. I don't have any mic. Can you hear me? I can.
Well, you've used two really important words um, there, and that's, that's fantastic. So uh, we used to talk a lot about lead-free, but now what we talk about is lead-safe. Um, similarly to asbestos, sometimes we, it's, rather than trying to remove things, it's a, it, it can be safer to seal things into place. So if you've um, uh, renovated an, an older home and you've sealed all the lead-based paint really well, that can make the house lead safe for children. But it's very important to be attentive uh, to making sure that that seal is, is well in place. So you definitely, after a renovation, want to do um, post-renovation clearance testing to make sure that uh, it really has been sealed in there. And the other thing is any place which we would call a high friction area, so a window when you're raising it up and you're raising it down, a door when you're opening it and you're closing it, any of those high friction areas, you would want to test those on a regular basis because it's almost always the case that you'll, you'll unless you actually replace the windows and you replace the door framing, it's almost always the case that you'll end up um, getting through some of those um, layers, that, that sealing layer eventually. So it's important to be attentive over time. I'm not aware of work that's looking at substance abuse. Um, our larger research group, some collaborators that we're working with, I don't actually uh, do animal uh, model work, but um, one of my principal research collaborators is looking at air pollution and whether or not you can mitigate against air pollution effects. We are, uh, in kind of the negative direction, one of the things that we're finding is that if you have early exposure to air pollution, like prenatal exposure to air pollution, I guess that would be prenatal exposure to air pollution, um, that, so if you take moms who are, rats who are exposed to air pollution prenatally, and then you feed them a high fat diet versus rats who are not exposed to uh, air pollution prenatally and you feed them a high fat diet, the combination of air pollution and high fat diets leads to overweight and obesity, weight gains in a really extraordinary way. So it's, it's, it's much worse than just having a high fat diet, having that prenatal exposure. So we, there, there, are, there is work like this going on, especially with respect to air pollution and either another uh, hit or air pollution and uh, enriched environments. Lead water pipes, so sure, that's, um, I'm, this is falling off. See, it's off. I don't know what to do. Okay, okay. Uh, so the lead water pipes are really interesting. So you would think water flowing through lead pipes, that's a bad thing. There could be water that's leaching out, especially depending upon on what the pH of the water is, et cetera. Um, over time, a lead pipe has a um, film that forms on the inside of the pipe. So there's a pipe, there's the film, so the pipe that has lead on it, in it, there's the, f or the solder that has lead in it, there's the film and then the water, right? So if the water is running through here and there's a film that completely coats all the things that have lead in it, then, the, then, then you actually don't need to worry about lead in the pipes. But we have a whole series of changes in water treatment systems that are going on right now, primarily because the disinfection processes that we are using uh, to treat water um, produce disinfection, uh, disinfection byproducts called trihalomethanes, and trihalomethanes are clearly carcinogenic. So we're trying to change some of the ways that we disinfect in some communities. There's a really complicated water chemistry, and it's actually quite a number of communities. 
And when you change the way that you disinfect, you change the water chemistry, and what happened in a number of communities, including this, there was a huge controversy in Washington, D.C. There was uh, something in Greenville, South Carolina. We had an instance in uh, a, a, a situation in Durham, North Carolina, and various other places across the country that when you change that water disinfection, you change the water chemistry, it eats away at the film. So then all of a sudden the water is flowing through the pipes and actually t touching the pipes and the solder and things like that that have lead in it, and depending on how acidic the water is, you could leach out quite a bit of lead. Eventually, right now the current thinking is eventually a new film forms, but in that transitional period, um, it, it's potentially problematic. And what I will tell you for certain, um, because we did a lot of work on this, is that the current strategy that the EPA uses, its standard testing, um, it, has a, it has a very standardized program that every municipal water treatment system uses to test for a variety of contaminants, including lead. The way that that program is structured simply will not catch these changes. So the, all of these places where we've had these changes and we've had lead poison kids associated with that, the standard EPA monitoring was going on and it was all clear. So you need, when you do the changes in those disinfection systems, at least during that transitional time, you need to fundamentally change the way that you're testing the system to make sure that your kids are safe. Yep. Um, so I'm just wondering how generalizable are your results with respect to age of housing and the, the amount of lead? So is it safe to assume that, you can assume that all older houses have more lead, but are you finding, like when you found that U-shaped curve that around Duke, is that what you're finding in other urban areas with the same level of housing? So we've, uh, th that particular model that I described, we've built for uh, 43 counties in North Carolina, and we've done national replication in the city of Detroit, in Wisconsin, in the state of Washington, in the state of Oregon, um, and some work in Connecticut as well. What we're finding is that all of the risk factors that we're looking at are, are, seem to be important uh, across the board but the relative weights are a little bit different depending on the county. Now the beauty of this, this is once we figured out how to do it, it took us almost two years to figure out how to build that model well. Now that we know how to build that model well, we can bring, if we have the data, we can bring a new county on in about two weeks, right? And the whole point is you've gotta tailor it to, so if you think about it, why would it matter from one county to another? Well, depending upon uh, so when we built the model for the city of Detroit, we had to pay attention to industrial areas. Uh, there are other areas where there was just because of the nature of the construction and because, you know, oh, there's, you know, these uh, salt winds that are coming in that much more lead was used in the paint as opposed to other areas where there was less. So we, it, during particular time periods, oh, this was near a war production facility, so there was no lead to be had. Oh, this was, you know, it's all, it's, it's important to pay attention to the local context. And that's the beauty of this technology, right? We don't have to treat every child the same. We wouldn't do that in the pediatric setting, in the clinic setting. We don't have to treat every community the same either. We can let the, these, powerful technologies that build these data architectures allow us to create tailored programs around the individual circumstances. Um, I guess a question about the jiggering of the data. Mm -hmm. um, your term. But, um, so you jiggered the data um, of um, the health department data and I assume the test scores of the students also since those were related in the end. Um, when I display them for you, yeah. When yes? you display, so you have another data set then that the health department is using to so go. So when and we're doing when we're doing the analysis, mm -hmm. we're doing it on the real data. You know, you have the real data. I, okay. We have the real data. When I come out here in a public setting and I'm displaying it, that's not appropriate for me to display the real data. So I have to I have to display simulated data, okay. but we simulate it in a way that replicates the spatial structure independence. So the patterns that you're seeing with your eye are actually consistent with the patterns in the real data. Okay, and then, um, so how did you get access to students' test scores? That's not something, 
an average researcher could just go out and get access to students' test scores, I wouldn't think. I think you just said I was an above average researcher. I think I did. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Outstanding. So, um, so, you know, what I would say is it's not about being ab an above average researcher, it's about being above average at building relationships and building trust. So, uh, I have three children they, in these North Carolina databases. They're in the lead surveillance database. They're, we have all of the vital records data. We have the education data. You know, my children are in those databases. I understand as a parent how important it is to treat these things um, with an enormous amount of respect and care. Uh, I also understand that the people in the agencies who manage these data need to be able to believe that they can they can trust my group with the data. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of things that happen. First of all, the data, the server where the data resides is absolutely state of the art. And it is, 100% it, of the time, it has been the case that I could truthfully argue that the data was more secure sitting on our server than it was sitting wherever they stored the data. So I could, I, I could promise them a higher degree of security than they even enjoyed in their own setting. And um, the second thing is we do a variety of pro bono work for the state agencies who provide these data. They're incredibly under-resourced. So we're always thinking about, well, what can we do to be helpful to you? And we'll oftentimes do a series of pro bono work even before we get any data, anything like that. And we're never asking for compensation for any of the things that we do for the agencies. So slowly but surely, you, you build these relationships, which is, so it, it's not about having a really good statistical model. It's about understanding the, the preciousness of the data and understanding the importance of having credible systems that will protect the data and taking the time to build relationships. So it took us years to build the relationships to, that got us access to all of these data. I think we have time for a couple more questions. And use the mic. Dr. Miranda, do you study anything beyond the lead, or is that the primary focus for the research that you're doing? So we study a lot of things besides lead. Lead is our most, we've been working on lead the longest, so it's our most mature project. Uh, we look at um, air pollution, pesticide exposures. Uh, <clears throat> we've done work on mercury and arsenic. We've done work on, um, uh, manganese, we've done work on um, the quality of the built environment, what, you know, how well, you know, just kind of the actual structure of houses, not that there are contaminants, but is it a nice neighborhood, are there falling in roofs, are there, you know, crack foundations, are there parks for kids to play in, those sorts of things. And we've done it looking at endpoints of both neurocognitive endpoints, respiratory endpoints, um, and reproductive endpoints. All of the techniques that we've developed, um, we really love working with children. All of the techniques that we've developed are equally relevant for adult health endpoints. So we have major, and we were approached by collaborators about taking our techniques and applying them to adult health endpoints. So right now, we have a major um, effort funded by the um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation and by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation. Um, to do spatial, to have these kind of spatial data architectures inform community-based interventions for type 2 diabetes. So, and we're now we're working on hypertension and um, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, COPD, a variety of health endpoints. So I used to always joke around, I'm a PhD and not an MD, but I spend a lot of time in um, clinics with both pregnant moms and kids, and I, I used to joke around about um, how I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure I could play a pediatrician on TV, or I'm not a doctor, I'm pretty, but I'm pretty sure I could pretend to catch a baby, be an OB on TV. And um, I have this one um, project, which is me and nine male cardiologists. <laughs> that is an interesting environment. Uh, and I have now officially been anointed by them as uh, you're not a cardiologist, but you definitely could play one on TV. So we're <laughs> we're we're expanding our um, we're expanding our repertoire. 
Hi. Um, we wanted to, uh, <clears throat> up here in the middle. Okay. We wanted to uh, grow uh, food in uh, downtown Grand Rapids, but the very lead, a lot of lead in the soil, so we went to try to build raised bed gardens uh, with clean soil, but then we found research out of Chicago showing um, lead, windborne lead dust recontaminating, and then we got really worried about building it here. We kind of replicated the study that went on in Chicago for here in Grand Rapids. What's, and we have geotag data as well. What's the best way to get that to the public and to the academic world? Uh, the, the best way to do that, it, it would it'd be a lot easier for me if I could sit down with you and take a look at it in more detail and figure things out to, uh, about what might be the best way. Um, I'd have a lot of questions about the, how the study design here versus the study design there, also the soil types and different things like that. Um, and I'd be delighted to talk with you about that and, and to the extent that it would be helpful to you bring the resources of CHI to bear on that. Um, in general, I would say that uh, you know the Grand Rapids community better than I do. Um, so thinking a little bit about, um, ha I would absolutely engage with, uh, local health departments are really important to engage with, I would absolutely engage with them. I would also think about um, community groups that provide leadership in the community. So if there are, uh, and I would start with kind of a focus group or a round table with them, sort of indicating here are some of the things that we're finding out, um, what's your reaction to that, how could we think about getting, um, what's your reaction, what might be effective ways to get it out into the community. So we typically, rather than saying, here's our way to get it out into the community, we go to leaders in the community and come up with a joint plan about how to get it out into the community. And um, it's a lot more effective. So in the, a lot of the communities that I've worked in, which are predominantly African American um, and, and Hispanic communities, we work through, in the African American community, we work through the network of black Baptist churches. So it's very common as we find something that we think is important for the black community to know about for me to sit down in a round table format with you know, a dozen black, minister, black Baptist ministers to talk about, here's what we're finding, what do you think, um, how do we get this message out? And they end up becoming vested in the problem and I'll be honest, a number of the things that we work on are things that the community brought to us to work on, saying, you know, we're worried about this. Should we be? You know, can you bring some, you know, analytical um, rigor to things? So it's kind of a two-way street. But I'd, I'd be delighted to, I'm happy to give you my card, and we can talk more. It'd be a lot of fun to take a look at it. And it would give me another very concrete way to get to know the Grand Rapids community better. Yes, sir? Uh I'd like to just make a point about another endpoint of air pollution. Uh, I'm an orthodontist, and I've been in practice for 43 years almost. Uh, and something that's interesting that we're seeing, uh, while you think of orthodontists as just straightening teeth, we deal with growth and development of the face. In the last 10 or 15 years, I noticed a dramatic increase of nasal and oral uh, you know, mucosa enlargement, large tonsils, adenoids, and so on. And of course, it affects the way the face grows. Why is that? Because basically, life you get able to breathe. If you can't, you do whatever you can. So you tend to posture the tongue forward, and, uh, and you know, uh, it alters the way the face grows. But also, uh, there was a great study in Michigan in 2003 about the effects of enlarged tonsils and airway issues with ADD and ADHD. And of course, along with that, as adults, we also that if we have enlarged tonsils, it makes you uh, makes your heart beat harder because you need to get oxygen to your brain so you're more prone to high blood pressure, strokes, heart attacks, kidney, and so on. And I don't know what the cause of the air pollution, but it just seems like that has to be the only reason why we're seeing such a dramatic increase of long face syndromes, tongue thrusters, mouth breathers, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you were studying that, but that's just another end game from air pollution that we see. Okay, I ha we we don't we have not done any work on that, but I'm really intrigued um, by your comments, and I'm uh, now now I need to learn more about it. <laughs> and you could totally play an orthodontist on TV. <laughs> so okay, we're going to take one more question, and then okay, you know. Hi, uh, the study that you were showing us, the rat study, seemed to suggest that the environment that the rats were kept in had a lot to do uh, with 
the outcome in the pool, um, even compared to the you know their exposure to lead, is has CHI done anything? Um, worked on any projects around development of you know green spaces, parks, playgrounds in those communities where you find the kids uh, you know have, that have higher exposures to lead to see you know what outcomes might might come about from changing their environment or enhancing their environment. Right, so we are spending a lot of time right now focused on what we call the built environment, the quality of neighborhoods, the quality of housing, the availability of green spaces, the availability of community resources, places where people can gather and get social support and social connection, et cetera. We're increasingly seeing, we're, we're focused on uh, two endpoints related to that. Not At this point, we're not looking at neurocognitive outcomes. We're looking at um, pregnancy outcomes for moms, and we're looking at overweight and obesity for young children. And we're definitely, we've, we've published some work that shows that there's a clear relationship between the quality of the neighborhoods that um, kids are growing up in and that pregnant moms are living in. Um, so it's absolutely, it's something that uh, as a society we need to be attending to. So if that was my last question, I just wanted to do one little thing to wrap up. Uh, so thank you for that question, by the way. Um, so you know, I'm from the University of Michigan, and we say go blue all the time, and we mean it. Um, we, you know, we have a great love of the university, and I think that when people hear go blue, and uh, they tend to think about you know, pictures like this, our football team celebrating our win in the Sugar Bowl. Um, I apologize, I did not have time to upload um, our uh, men's basketball team from this past year. I, do, I would like to point out, however, that I, am, I have personally been given credit by the provost for shifting the basketball karma because I moved from Duke to Michigan. <laughs> You are welcome. So, uh, and here's another team that you might think about, the gymnastics team. We have a phenomenal gymnastics team at the university. Uh, here's another team you might think about. This is the baseball team. I have a great love of baseball because I have a son who plays a lot of baseball. I met my husband playing baseball. I, was a, uh, I played at the third base and he played at the shortstop. Um, and, and then everything after that was history. I periodically say to my husband, so, you know, if I'd been a right fielder, <laughs> which is, you know, what would have happened? So here's another team that you might think of when you hear go blue. Um, but here's another team, right? So the, the, those are the children at Head Start, and this is their teacher, right? So this is a team. This is a, this is a team that's as much part of the University of Michigan, and it's a team that we should be caring about and be passionate about as much as we should be passionate about our football team our basketball team, our gymnastics team, our field hockey teams. And this is another team that we should be incredibly uh, excited about and supportive of. So this is a group of children in a uh, rural village in Tanzania. On Saturday, I leave for Morogoro region in Tanzania for um, a couple of weeks of field work. And um, it's, uh, you know, this is as much a University of Michigan team as our football program, as much of a University of Michigan team as our women's basketball team. And I, I hope that when you think about our great university, you'll be thinking about, and, and when you say go blue, you'll be thinking about not only the traditional athletic teams, but you'll also be thinking about our great teams of students. And so my thing is falling off. See, I was headed towards such a nice ending. You know, you'll be thinking about our great football team, you'll be thinking about our great women's golf team, our swimming and diving team, but you'll also be thinking about our teams of students who are out there working in communities, our collaborative efforts between our faculty and our students and local communities, and um, a whole group of people, a whole university, tens of thousands of people who are fundamentally committed to serving the world. That is the University of Michigan. That is the School of Natural Resources and Environment. Thank you very much.